Capitol. Down the mall, President Trump airing his grievances in front of his supporters at a rally uh, nearby, and he was warning vengeance for Republicans who did not take his side in objecting to these results. Uh, they appear to be Trump supporters who are frustrated with the outcome and are trying to breach some of that uh, the, those security uh, perimeters around the Capitol. USA! USA! until the call of the chair. We'll pause. Right. That's for sure. We have visual evidence that, that some protesters have made it inside the Capitol building around the security and are gathering around the area where the Senate was in session. Uh, we were just told that there has been tear gas in the rotunda. Members of the legislature were informed that they should don their gas masks. Yep. Uh, gas masks. In the meantime, yeah. though, as we've been reporting, the trial has revealed a number of new chilling details about the January 6th attack on the Capitol. And today, we have learned even more. For the first time, Senator Patty Murray from Washington State and the highest-ranking female Democrat in the Senate is speaking publicly about the terror she experienced that day while hiding just inches from the violent mob who she says were looking to kill. She and I spoke this morning before the defense team presented their case. Senator, I know this is very personal for you because you were close to uh, where the rioters ended up being in the Capitol. Take us back to that day and tell us uh, what happened. Well, I, I came to the Capitol that day, as I do every day, uh, and it was fairly loud outside. I had heard the president um, speak, and I was very aware that this crowd was um, pretty you know, negative. And so I texted my family and said, I'm on my way. I'll let you know when I get safely to the Capitol. And I did. I texted them, and I said, I'm in my office. I'm safe. That turned out to not be true. And I was preparing uh, myself uh, in an office very close to the Senate floor uh, when all of a sudden um, I saw, I could see out the window, the, the people who were protesting were no longer protesting. They were breaking through. They were angry. They were yelling. They were loud. And I still felt, well, I, I'm in the Capitol. I'm safe because that's what, what we feel. Um, and it wasn't long before I, I heard explosions, I heard yelling, uh, and all of a sudden they were in the hallway outside my door. I was inches away, along with my husband, who was with me at the time. And we were really frightened. Uh, we we um, were hearing the announcements to stay locked down. Uh, we heard loud explosions. My husband yelled at me to get down. We were lying on the floor. And uh, all of a sudden they were in the hall. They were yelling. They were yelling that they had breached the castle. They were yelling, kill the infidels. And we heard somebody saying, we saw them, they're in one of these rooms. And they were pounding on our door and trying to open it. And my husband sat with his foot against the door, praying that it would not break in. I was not safe. From the Capitol. It's a heartbreaking day and it needs to stop, and the president needs to be the first to help make it stop. What the hell was uh, law enforcement on Capitol Hill thinking uh, by not having uh, secured the Capitol today? We are hours into a siege on the Capitol building of the United States of America, and we have not seen the president of the United States. Look, I can think of no greater failure by a commander-in-chief than to allow this kind of disturbance to continue 
and not stop it. An explosive device has been located at the headquarters of the Republican National Committee. That explosive device was real, was detonated by a bomb squad, and harmed no one. This has really been pouring gasoline on a fire, and we need to uh, push back on this, not only on the rhetoric, but also on those extremist groups that are capitalizing on it. I call on this mob to pull back and allow the work of democracy to go forward. I call on President Trump to go on national television now to fulfill his oath and defend the Constitution. Two-thirds of the senators present not having voted guilty. The Senate judges that the respondent, Donald John Trump, former president of the United States, is not guilty as charged in the article of impeachment. There's no question, none, that President Trump is practically and morally responsible for provoking the events of the day. No question about it. The people who stormed this building believed they were acting on the wishes and instructions of their president. But in this case, the question is moot because former President Trump, Trump is constitutionally not eligible for conviction. I believe the best constitutional reading shows that Article 2, Section 4 exhausts the set of persons who can legitimately be impeached tried or convicted. It's the president, it's the vice president, and civil officer. We now go to our final guest tonight, Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell. Hello, Tucker. Now, Senator McConnell, why did you vote to acquit Donald Trump? And while you talk, I'm going to have a look on my face like a baby seeing his first balloon. Because everyone knows you cannot impeach a former president. That's why we should have impeached him before, back when I said we couldn't. Well, that logic pretzels out, but what do you really think of Trump? I think he's guilty as hell. And the worst person I ever met, and I hope every city, county, and state locks his ass up. Wow. So what's next? I don't know about my colleagues, but I plan to reach my hand across the aisle, and then yank it back and slide it across my hair and say, too slow. <laughs> That's beautiful. Uh, thanks for coming, Senator. We will be back. Hey, all. Glenn Kirshner here. So, the Senate voted to acquit Donald Trump today, found him not guilty, even though he incited an insurrection, he launched his angry mob on the U.S. Capitol, he told them to go down there and fight, 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 and stop what was going on in that building, certifying Joe Biden's election win. He told them to get down there and stop it, and they did, with deadly consequences. Everyone is in agreement Donald Trump did that. Let's turn to Mitch McConnell, because did you see his speech? After he voted not guilty, Mitch McConnell stood in front of the cameras, massaging his own guilty conscience. And it was ugly. Mitch McConnell said, Donald Trump did this. He launched this insurrection. People died. He had no right. He said, Donald Trump should be prosecuted. But, Mitch McConnell said, I'm going to vote not guilty because I don't think we can have an impeachment trial in the Senate if the president has left office. So he took the jurisdictional out. That was how he weaseled out of voting guilty. Remember, Mitch McConnell was the one who said, I will not start the impeachment trial in the Senate until after Donald Trump leaves office. And then Mitch McConnell says, because Donald Trump had already left office, by the time we got around to the Senate trial, gosh, I'd love to 
vote guilty, but I just can't because he's not in office anymore. This is what Mitch McConnell did in effect. Let's assume Donald Trump was wanted for a bank robbery. And let's assume Mitch McConnell took Donald Trump and hid him out in his basement. Now, there's this thing called the statute of limitations. If you're not familiar with it, it just means that you have to bring somebody to trial. You have to prosecute them within five years of the date they committed the crime. So when five years and one day passes, you can't prosecute the, the bank robber because the clock has run out. The time has expired. The statute of limitations expires and it prohibits a prosecution. This is just like Mitch McConnell taking Donald Trump, hiding him out in his basement for five years and one day, and then offering him up and saying, oh, it would be great if he could be prosecuted for the bank robbery, but the statute of limitations has expired. The clock has run out. That's what Mitch McConnell did. He orchestrated this injustice. Make no mistake about it. This injustice was a Mitch McConnell production. Just as Mitch McConnell proudly declares himself the Grim Reaper of legislation, where all bills passed by the House of Representatives go to die in Mitch McConnell's legislative graveyard, and I'm the Grim Reaper. Well, Mitch McConnell is also the Grim Reaper of justice. Mitch McConnell is where political justice goes to die. And today, the political process failed the American people. It failed our democracy badly. How should the nation respond to an ex-president who has incited an insurrection, brought our democracy to the brink of destruction, and left so much pain and suffering in his wake? In addition to being convicted in the Senate, which could bar him from running for office again, he should not be allowed anywhere near the cushy benefits former presidents receive. These benefits were created under the Former Presidents Act of 1958, which was drawn up after Harry Truman told the House Majority Leader that he was going broke. The benefits in the Former Presidents Act now include a yearly pension of over $200,000, an annual $1 million travel budget, an annual $500,000 travel budget for spouses, an office appropriately furnished and equipped, and staff to operate that office for the rest of the former president's life. But what about a twice-impeached former president who did everything he could to attack black and brown communities and ended his presidency by inciting an insurrection against the United States government? Well, call me old-fashioned, but I don't think someone with that record should receive millions in taxpayer-funded benefits at all, let alone every single year for the rest of his life. Now, thankfully, it doesn't have to happen. A simple majority in Congress can pass a law barring this ex-president from the normal perks afforded to former presidents. For the sake of the country, Congress must do so. He should also be barred from receiving national security briefings now that he's left office. There's no reason that someone this dangerous should be privy to the highest levels of intelligence as a private citizen, especially given his looming legal and financial entanglements with foreign entities. He was already a national security risk in office. As a private citizen, there is no telling what he would do with classified information. Now, fortunately, it doesn't take an act of Congress to cut off access to briefings. It's up to Joe Biden and Joe Biden alone. Biden has the power to prevent his predecessor from receiving any and all national security briefings. For the sake of America and the world, he must do so, regardless of how the impeachment trial in the Senate ends. One thing is clear, someone who has disgraced the office of the president so maliciously should not reap its amenities for the rest of his life. No cushy benefits, no national security briefings, no perks for the worst president in history. Mr. Cohen, you reminded me, I think it was that in your Senate testimony, 
where you said Donald Trump doesn't come right on out and tell you to do the, the bad thing, the illegal thing. He hints, he intimates, and that was sort of... Uh, the the sort of reaction from the Republicans, which is he never he never told anybody to do this. He never said to you know violently you know go and invade invade the U.S. in the invade the U.S. Capitol. Am I reading that right? You are because Donald Trump, as I stated in my book, disloyal, as well as I talk about on Mea Culpa. Donald Trump speaks in code. He's like a mob boss. He's not going to come right out and say, storm the castle. Instead, what did Donald Trump do? And this is the important line that nobody really discussed. What Donald Trump said is, I will meet you at the Capitol. So all of these individuals (laughs) thinking that they're going to be going there with the president, with the celebrity power that Donald Trump controlled. They all thought that he was going to go there. Instead, what did he do? Like the coward that he is, along with the GOP members, cowards, what he did is he went running right back to the White House. He turned on the multitude of televisions that are sitting inside of the East Wing, and he watched as these individuals, for his benefit, stormed the Capitol, trying to take it over so he could ultimately become the autocrat that he wants to be. It's just plain and simple to me. I see it. I see it crystal clear. What bothered me a lot, though, about this entire impeachment sequel is the fact that everybody knew the answer in terms of what was going to be coming down the pike. We all knew he wasn't going to be um, convicted. Yes, he was impeached for a second time, but we all knew he wasn't going to be convicted because there were not 17 Republicans that had the conviction um, in order to do it, that they're basically cowards, as I have been saying on social media. Mm -hmm. There's no courage in any of them. And I do truly hope that the country remembers this. And in 2022, right, when despite Lindsey Graham's appeal to Donald Trump's narcissistic ego, right, to his flattery needs, that Donald Trump lost them additional House um, seats in the House. He certainly lost the Senate and they lost the White House. I don't really think the odds are in their favor for a 2022, right, for the midterm elections. And I don't see a 2024. All he's doing is setting up continued grift so that he could continue to raise money from all of these individuals that are foolishly sending him and to this crazy super PAC that he created that's really nothing more than a slush fund. Mr. Cohen, you know, you have been very upfront um, and in your book, in your congressional testimony about how you did dirty deeds for Donald Trump. You were loyal to Donald Trump. You did whatever he wanted. And then you found out that the loyalty didn't go two ways. It was a one way street and you liberated yourself. And now you're here on my show and on other shows um, speaking loudly about what Donald Trump did and what he's like. My question to you is, this time yesterday, we thought we were barreling down the road to a Senate impeachment trial with witnesses. And I kept thinking, what would it take to get Vice President Mike Pence to testify, to be a witness in the Senate impeachment trial? We're not going to have that. But there are Republicans who have been uh, continue to be and will be loyal to Donald Trump. And what would be your advice to the Mike Pence's, uh, Lindsey Graham's, and others to liberate themselves from the hold of Donald Trump? Get out while you can, because nothing good, nothing lives around Donald Trump. Everything around Donald Trump dies. I mean, the fact is, he's willing to let everybody else go down the rabbit hole in order to protect himself. And it's not just people like myself or the insurrectionists that stormed the Capitol. He would do it to his children. He would do it to Mike Pence. He will do it to anyone and everyone because Donald Trump doesn't care about anyone or anything other than himself.
Well, let's talk about this mask thing, because now the CDC says, I mean, I think I've got this right. One mask is better than zero masks. Two masks is better than one mask. But you don't have to have double masks. Is, is that right? I mean, <laughs> you know, it is. In fact, you know, Savannah, you and I had this conversation on your show. I mean, it must have been a month or so ago because someone had said, I've seen people wear two masks. The recommendation is not that you have to wear it, but the CDC is saying that, that at minimum, wear a mask, okay? <laughs> this is what they're saying. Make sure you wear a mask. So you wear a mask. Then you want it to fit better. So one of the ways you could do it, if you would like to, is put a cloth mask over, which actually here and here and here, where you could get leakage in, is much better contained. Okay. That's all they're okay. saying. One mask at least, but if you want to really be sure, get a tighter fit with the second mask. Wait a minute, are you a double masker, Dr. Fauci? You look <laughs> like you are. Well, I have. In fact, I have used it occasionally, mostly, Savannah, for what the CDC is saying. The fit is better. If you get the surgical mask on and you put a cloth mask over, those areas around where some aerosol can get in are better fitting. Okay. So again, minimal, at least one mask, likely a double ply type of mask would be good. <laughs> but if you want to get, yeah, yeah if you want to prefer that, just get a better fit. Got it. Okay, real quickly, and we're going to ask answer a bunch of viewer questions next hour, but I know the number one thing has to do with, you know, folks who are elderly, our, our moms and dads, my kids' grandparents, a lot of them are getting their vaccines now. And once they're fully vaccinated, can they see their kids? Can they see their grandkids? Can they go to a restaurant? Can they go to Costco? I mean, once they're fully vaccinated, can they go back to their normal lives? You know, in essence, ultimately, yes. The, the thing you would like to see, Samana, is if you have two parties vaccinated. And that's the question we get asked more often. If I'm vaccinated and my daughter who lives in Boston comes home and she's vaccinated, can we get much more of this pulling back on restrictions and saying we can sit down together without a mask, we can give each other a hug? And the answer ultimately is going to be yes with that. But if when grandma's have... vaccinated but grandkid isn't? Yeah, then you got to be careful because grandma could still get virus in her nasopharynx, even though the vaccine is preventing her from getting physically ill, she still could have virus in her nasopharynx. And that's the reason why we say until we have the overwhelming majority of people vaccinated and the level of virus is very low, when you're vaccinated, you still, it would be prudent to wear a mask for the reason that I just mentioned. Okay.